Good afternoon. And who was ever responsible for that music, that was great. Welcome to the Liam Bernard Jaffe Family Jewish Book Festival. We are absolutely thrilled to have Dr. Roizen return to our community to discuss his <clears throat> newest book, The What to Eat When Cookbook. And as many of you know, who attended the luncheon last year, it's hard to believe it's been a year, this book is the sequel to the What to Eat When, where we learn that the timing of our meals, the when we eat, is just as important as the what we eat, especially for disease prevention and longevity that I know Dr. Royson will address. Now we have the practical tips. And as a nutrition professor and a consultant now with Neighborhood Harvest, I love how this cookbook provides really healthy nuggets of nutritional information like make your veggies great again and eat only when the sun is up in a practical and easily digested, digestible, excuse the pun, format to help you eat healthier. The 125 delicious recipes are easy to follow. I've read the entire book. There's expert cooking tips and prep tips, as well as these really sort of sneaky substitutions like the raisin reduction in place of sugar and vegetable cream in place of butter. I've tried the artichoke cream with the egg frittata and it was fabulous. Our program today is brought to you in partnership with Hadassah, Norfolk and Virginia Beach, thank you, the Simon, JCC, and JFIT, and it will be um, in a webinar format, so you will be muted throughout the program. However, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to address as many questions as time permitting. Links to purchase your book uh, will be in the chat box and let us know if you have a book or when you purchase it, because we will send you a book plate signed by Dr. Royson. Before we start the program, I would like to introduce my good friend and co-moderator Tom Purcell, who is the Director of Wellness and Fitness at the Simon Family JCC. And Tom has worked over 25 years in the field of fitness, completing over 50 marathons and living what he preaches. Stay consistent and never let one week go by without exercising and really staying mindful of your diet. Um, and I can attest to that personally. Tom has been terrific this year navigating with COVID and is going to give us a quick update. Thank you, Sandra. I really appreciate this opportunity. I'm so excited to have Dr. Royzen back this year. Last year was such a success, and I'm still getting questions to this day. But uh, let me give a little update about what we're doing here at the Simon Family JCC. You know, first of all, the Simon Family JCC in Virginia Beach offers a wide variety of amenities to our community, from indoor and outdoor swimming, group exercise classes, personal training. We have basketball, indoor and outdoor pickleball courts, we offer steam rooms and saunas, and we even have a cafe that enjoy kosher foods made from scratch. So it's a wonderful environment that you come into. And we also offer month-to-month -month memberships. We don't do long-term memberships, and you can have a 30-day notice. We are doing a no-joining fee at the beginning of the year. If you um, feel comfortable about coming back, we have done extra work, and we are following the CDC guidelines uh, to the point that we have proper spacing for our classes, we're only limited to nine participants plus the instructor based on state guidelines. So we are making plenty of space of 10 foot plus distance in our classes. Also in our fitness center, we also space out our equipment. So you're not exercising next to folks. We do emphasize and you have to wear a mask when you do enter and leave the building. We do temperature checks and you have to answer certain questions when you do. So we're doing all due diligence here to keep everybody safe and sound. And if you feel like you're comfortable at coming in, we'd love to have you. You have to give a free week uh, membership to try us out and, and see if you like us. If you still feel comfortable, I want to stay home, but I still want to get exercise. We do or, uh, offer a virtual option for free. You can go onto our Facebook page, Simon Family JCC Facebook, check out our classes. I personally do a live class every day, Monday through Friday, from stretching to hit to body uh, type uh, exercises and you'll enjoy hopefully those and others that we have to offer and these date all the way back to March so we actually record these classes and you can go back and rewatch these at any time so you don't have to be on it live so we do offer that 
If you want to check out any more information, please go to our website, simonfamilyjcc.org. That's simonfamilyjcc.org and check us out for any questions, register for classes, register to swim, to have a swim lane, so everything, and we know that you're coming in and being safe. So that's about the JCC. So let's get to Dr. Roy's and, you know, nutrition and fitness goes hand in hand with wellness and having the knowledge to empower others. And that's truly what I believe in. Making the right choices is why we like to host seminars like this. We have great experts like Sandra Porter Leon, who's a dietitian. We have Dr. Roy's and you're going to hear in a moment about his new cookbook. Uh, but Dr. Roizen really needs no introduction. I mean, he's famous. You've seen him everywhere from television to Dr. Oz show to the Good Morning America. If you haven't seen him, he's going to look recognizable. But for those who don't know, let me give you a little uh, familiar about his work. Dr. Roizen is a number one New York Times bestselling author and a co-founder originator of the popular realage.com website. So if you're interested in your real age, go to the realage.com website. He is also the chief wellness officer, founding chair of the Wellness Institute of the Cleveland Clinic, and as well a chief medical consultant to the Dr. Oz Show. So we are honored to have Dr. Roy's in here today to come back again, just to tell us all about his great cookbook. And without further ado, take it away, Dr. Roy's. Thank you, Tom. Um, the, uh, I appreciate it. We are in the Cleveland Clinic uh, cooking, teaching kitchen. It's called culinary medicine. I am Mike Royzen, and with me is our executive chef, Jim Perko. He's going to leave the, uh, he's going to show you a couple recipes. We're going to actually do a couple recipes, simple recipes while you're here. He's going to leave now um, so that I can uh, demask and talk to you and show you uh, the slide uh, set. So um, I'm going to try and uh, put it over this way so that we can see um, and take the uh, mask off. Um, <laughs> it's, it's the job time. But any thank you very much for inviting me back. Um, last year, I was uh, thrilled to see the attendance um, and uh, you, the team at uh, your JCC, um, made enormous uh, arrangements as the uh, drive down was uh, hassled by uh, plane by cancellations. But in any case, I am absolutely thrilled to be back. And so I'm going to do a little bit of review of what we did um, last year. And then we'll do some cooking and have some fun. So um, I'm going to show the, share the screen, if you will. And uh, with luck, you'll be able to see that. Um, if uh, Sheriff or Tom, could tell me, uh, just tell me if you're Sandra or Tom, um, are you able to see this? Yes, we, we see it. We see okay. it. Okay. So um, what we're talking about is the What to Eat When cookbook. And as Sandra said, it's the companion uh, to What to Eat When. Um, the reason we wrote the cookbook was because people asked us how to implement the what to eat when pretty simply. We're going to talk um, about, uh, and I don't know what I just did wrong. Oh, I'm at the end, so I got it. For some reason, I got to the wrong part of the slide set, so there we are. Um, the, uh, we're going to talk about doing intermittent fasting right and the components of that. So... Our responses to the sun over centuries cause our circadian rhythm. And the job of our circadian rhythm, that's our response to the sun, is to get us to do the right thing at the right time. Um, and you know that because you want to sleep at night. That's part of what the circadian rhythm does. But the amazing thing about your response is that it sets you up for a whole raft of other things. You may not know this, and, and it is, we have, as we said, a whole group of 22,500 genes, but we have DNA for 300,000 genes, and the rest of that DNA in each cell is actually switches. The circadian rhythm 
changes about three quarters of those switches every day, twice a day. It modifies them from being on and highly active to being off or highly active, or if they're already off, it may modify them to be, if you will, further off, a double off switch, if you will. But it, the circadian rhythm has enormous changes to which of your genes are on or not. All genes do is produce proteins. And you, you can gauge that idea. We are more, we grow our, for men, if you will, you grow your beard more during the night. That's because that gene is turned on, that growth gene is turned on. Well, it also sets you up to be more metabolically active during the day. So a calorie isn't a calorie isn't a calorie. It is in the test tube, but in your body, eating more early, less later is a way to decrease your calories. That is the same food, let's say it's marked 300 calories, is about 240 calories in the morning and 340 in the evening. There's that big a difference of about 15% from morning to night. So eating the when way is to eat with the sun, eating more early, less later. And in fact, if you do it, if you stop eating three hours before bedtime and then don't eat till about 11 a.m., that's a form of intermittent fasting, meaning let's say you go to bed at 10 p.m., that's 13 hours of fasting till 11 a.m. and then three hours in addition, you're getting 16 hours which most of us get into ketosis at that point. That helps you rejuvenate your cells. So intermittent fasting done right is what we're talking about with the when way of eating. Most people make two mistakes when they're doing intermittent fasting, a big early meal and concentrating only on the when they're eating and not enough on the what. So remember, as we said last year, food is a relationship. You wouldn't marry someone who's trying to kill you every day. You shouldn't eat food that's trying to kill you every day. You may love French fries, but if they're trying to kill you, it's a bad choice. On the other hand, avocado, a great choice. Or salmon, a great choice. So we want you not to stereotype food. And as uh, you may remember, my favorite food is salmon burgers. So although there are 135 recipes in the book, um, there actually are 137 with three of them being um, salmon burgers. But a salad or an egg white frittata is great as, as Sandra tried the egg white frittata with the artichoke crema. It is superb, but every recipe that you eat or make should be superb from taste standpoint. You want to love it. Don't waste calories on something that's just okay. You want to love what you eat. And then we don't, we're not short of food, if you will, um, as a general rule in this community. So if you will, you want to eat food that you love. So you don't want to waste extra calories on food you don't love, and it should always love you back. So as you heard, we wrote What to Eat When to publicize the science of when way of eating or of doing intermittent fasting right, or of, if you will, eating in tune with the circadian rhythm. And the What to Eat When cookbook is to help people do it. Now, as I said, one of the reasons to do this is you're going to get to live a lot longer. And it's because of the research in aging. And one of those things that really helps you live a lot longer is in fact, your way you eat food. So since 1880, we've expanded life expectancy in the United States by about two and a half years every 10 years. We think longevity will be the next disruptor. This is the curve, if you will. And um, women are in blue. They always have a longer life expectancy than men in green. But since about 1880, we've expanded it by two and a half years, our life expectancy at birth. And the real change in the first 70 years was in population health, 
meaning childhood immunization, sanitation, that type of thing. In the last 70 years, this same two and a half year per 10 year has been because of concentration on older people. Um, a pandemic does shorten it. In 1917, um, if you will, compared to 1918, 12 year decrease in life expectancy with that pandemic, which by the way is, is still um, 10 times um, or more worse than this one um, from a death uh, percentage of people dying. In 1920, it rebounded fast. So we rebound fast in all of the pandemics that have been studied in life expectancy. And there are about four of them. It's the same status. A pandemic shorts life, shortens life expectancy and population, but we rebound fast. We have two pandemics now, opioids and COVID-19, but we expect to rebound fast. What's going to happen going forward? We expect it to go to exponential growth. So that two and a half years, we expect to increase by 30 years by 2030. That is that real jump. It'll obviously be a curve, it won't be a straight line, but it'll be a real jump in life expectancy. And one of the keys to that exponential growth is you keeping your brain young. And a huge part of that that we know how to do is in fact your food choices. So that's why we say longevity um, will be the uh, greatest disruptor and is, um, it really gives you life. All the others, like the chip from 61 years ago, still creating new changes that make life better, um, but longevity actually gives you life. And as we said, all genes do is make proteins or watch other genes, which genes are on or off. Not only does the circadian rhythm amplify or decrease whether they're on or off, but it also, you change it. So you have roughly 21,000 genes in the silent area, these that are unrolled and created next to mRNA, if you will, we've all heard a lot about mRNA with the vaccines, but next to the mRNA, that's how they're producing the proteins. But the majority are silent, and which ones are silent are largely your choices. So this is stress management. This is a heat map, the red genes here, this is 52 people with, um, if you will, uh, genes of 52 people. The red ones, it's called a heat map because the red genes are on. So in this group of 52 slices, these genes are largely on and these are largely off and they're even more off. N1 is before they did the stress management program. N2 is uh, 16 weeks after they started the stress management program. M is a year later. And you can see here, these genes were off, they get turned on. These largely go off as they progress through the stress management program and do it. And what, was, what, what, what are these genes up here? These create largely inflammatory proteins. These create proteins that dampen or decrease inflammation. So with just doing a stress management program, nothing else, you change around 256 genes from on to off or off to on. Food is the next greatest with about a 240 gene effect for major changes like this. But just imagine if you could go back to the fetal stage, eight cell stage, remember you still got the genes from that and reprogram your cells to go back there and then to get a new heart cell or grab a new knee joint, knee cartilage, or grab new brain cells or new skin. That's what has begun to happen in now eight different laboratories with animal experiments and now two starting with small groups of humans. Um, so the mitochondria are your energy factories, and they're something that we feel tired as we get older. You can't do as much exercise as Tom would like you to do or as you'd like to do if your mitochondria have damage. 
And what happens is glucose or fat comes in essentially at one end of the mitochondria. It ch is changed into ATP, which produces energy at the other. And one of the things is to not overload those mitochondria with too much glucose or fat at any one time, because they will get, they'll overwhelm your antioxidant capacity, um, which is really three antioxidants, catalase, glutathione, and SOD. And it'll overwhelm those, just like extreme marathon running or um, playing basketball for four hours in a row without a break would do. Well, food does the same thing, and that's why we think um, we get less energy to chase our grandkids as we get older. But with an embryonic reboot, when the cell reproduces, it copies the cells you had near birth, and you get all that energy back. The Yamanaka factors, those are these genes, OCT14, at SOX2, KLF4, and C Mike, all are involved in repairing, getting back to that stage. By the way, C Mike is very heavily influenced by the circadian rhythm. So, what happens when you turn these on again, as we're now able to do at least the eight laboratories with uh, animals have been able to do? The animal gets younger their muscle and pancreas returns to a state where they were near the equivalent in human of age 20. We're going to, if 60 is now the new 40, 90 will be the new 40 by 2030, we believe. Um, and uh, I disclose my conflicts. Um, and I guess the, the main thing is not to tell you about these two number one New York Times bestsellers, Real Age and You, but when You on a Diet came out, and that's how important diet is, it knocked Harry Potter off of number one for 177 days. Um, and if you will, the, um, it became number one in five other countries as well. You can see she's concerned about aging, especially if you read Portuguese or Spanish. Beja is the national magazine of Brazil. I've been on the cover five times because of diet and aging. And most people can't find me. I'm up here in the upper left. Um, so what to eat when is what we're going to talk about. And before we get to that, I'm going to ask you a few questions. What was Elvis's major contribution and how much was it worth to America? That's question one. You can write that down or think about that as we go through. Um, and what is intermittent fasting? Is it not eating for 18 hours of every 24? Is it nothing but water for two or more days? Is it going to ketosis anyway, hopefully healthfully? Is it a mimicking diet that gets 750 calories a day for five days? Well, most people say it is all of those, but I'd like to tell you it really is number three. To do intermittent fasting right, you want to get to ketosis, that is, to have ketones as your major source of energy for a period of every day. That's what's shown to give you health. What organ hasn't been able to be rebooted back to youth? Is it the heart? Now, the heart's pretty complex. It's got valves, it's got an electrical system as well as a muscle. Is it the brain? Obviously, you know how complex that is. Is it the kidney, which holds on to water or not? and solutes, your basic proteins are filtered by the kidney. It's a pretty complex system. The liver both produces proteins from your genes and excretes them and purifies. It, it does a lot of things um, and it's pretty complex. Or is it the bladder? You say, well, the bladder is just there. No, it tells you when you have to urinate. It tells you it's got neurologic components. So you're urinating when you want to. Um, so it's got muscle and sensors. Well, the one that is, you can guess, is the toughest to re reboot is the brain. So we're going to talk about how to keep your brain young. And if you will, there are 32 things that have been shown to reverse brain aging. I'm shortening some of this because of our time component. 
Um, so if you look at the 32 things that can help you keep your brain young, the ones in yellow, um, that's eight of them, are ones that relate to food. So the majority of things, and the second most important thing after managing stress is in fact food choices. And just to think, can you prevent it with food? Yeah, this is a study that got published about two years ago that just five lifestyle choices can reduce dementia risk 60%. And the most important, and these weren't done perfectly, it's just regular exercise. So Tom would be unhappy to know that that was just 30 minutes a day of anything you did. You really want to do the four components of physical activity. But even just any regular activity, coming to a session like this, talking with friends or engagement activity, just these. And you see the most important in this one was food choices. In another study published this last year, which is two longitudinal studies, independent of your genes, you could reduce your dementia risk by, 60, by 90%. And 60% was just by following a healthy diet alone. Let me repeat that. Just by doing a healthy diet. So even if you're E4, E4, two heavy E, two E4s, you're, you're predicted to have a 92% risk of uh, cognitive dysfunction by age 90, it, by food alone, it reduces into the 40% range. And if you did all of the things recommended, it's under 10% risk. If you're E3, E3, the usual one, you go from about 22% down to a 2% risk. Amazingly changes, you have enormous power over your brain and the most important thing are your food choices. So the data on time-restricted uh, feeding, that is four days of eating just from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. versus the same 8 a.m., 2 p.m., and 8 p.m., same calories. Every marker of longevity was decreased or went to the better side by within four days. In every gene function, this is amazing to me that we turn our genes on and off so often. But in fact, with just doing this for four days, it changed which genes were on or off in the big sense, not just that circadian rhythm modification, but this was in a big sense of turning those genes that we know that I showed you before were responsible for getting us back to youthful epigenetics useful switches that change within those change within four days so what happens well after 10 to 14 hours of fasting you fast overnight you stop eating at 8 p.m and you're not going to eat till 11 a.m the next day well after 10 to 14 hours of that your liver runs out of glucose and you start using that ketones or get into ketosis from food once you get in that, that changes how your genes function. So your body, in essence, thinks you're in starvation and wants to get you to recycle those cells. When you then, and, and by the way, it turns off the growth and turns on repair system, it actually increases your brain growth. But then when you start eating again, you get you recycle those old cells into new cells and you get young again. So the, the message is when you do that when way of intermittent fasting, essentially time-restricted eating, it's doable. And it's a reasonable way to stay younger and to keep your brain younger. For those of you who want to, it's in the New England Journal of Medicine, a summary in 2019 um, in the December issue. So doing intermittent fasting right, our response to the sun over the centuries causes our circadian rhythm. Uh, the job is to get us ready for life and to set us up. It does set us up to be more metabolically active in the day. We want you to do intermittent fasting right and to make sure though that you enjoy food. That is, food is a relationship, you should love it. 
And so that's what the cookbook and eating this way is all about. And now we're going to start with the Wenwei chocolate mousse. You say, how can a chocolate mousse be healthy? Well, you're going to see how Chef Jim cooks it. That's what it looks like. And this is the recipe from the book. And we're now going to go to uh, the major joys, no eggs, no cream, great chocolate polyphenols that keep your arteries functioning younger and your brain. And there are lots of ways to make chocolate mousse, but most of them involve cream and, and sugar and yolks. Those are no foods to keep your brain healthy. Our version swaps cream for water and it helps the chocolate really shine. Um, we're now going to go to Chef Jim. I'm going to put my mask on and uh, unscreen share so you can see Chef Jim. Um, and I'm going to leave the kitchen as well so he can um, show you cooking. Chef Jim, this is Jim Furco. Hey, everybody. So I'm, I'm leaving so you can take your mask off. I'll, I'll do that. Okay. All right. So Dr. Reisen just left the kitchen, so I'm going to unmask. So we're going to do two recipes. I'm going to start with the garden chai bean dip first. So this is a recipe that's totally a love you back. Easy to make. It'll last in the fridge for an easy three days. You could take, you could, when you're, if you come home from work and you're hungry, you've got something really healthy to nosh on, or you can take it to work as a bag lunch, okay? So let's begin. Um, also, one of the take homes on this recipe is it combines scratch with convenience products. Convenience products meaning something that you could easily just purchase and buy at a store, but most importantly, they're healthy convenience products. Okay, so right off the bat, I have frozen lima beans that I think I, yeah, I didn't know if I saw a question there or not. Yeah. Um, but we, if there are questions, we can, ask, we can answer those questions after Dr. Royson finishes his slides. Okay, so 12 ounce bag of frozen lima beans, right? Cook as directed on the package. And I mean, so you can just go in this grocery grocer and buy these from the freezer. So, goes into a food processor. Then I got one half cup of canned artichokes. Uh, something else, again, you can buy at your grocer, but they're healthy. And I drained and rinsed them. Then I have one cup of frozen green peas that you could buy at your grocer, right? Um, I have five tablespoons of lemon juice. Now this is fresh squeezed but you could easily buy lemon juice in a jar. I have one half cup of tahini. Now tahini is ground sesame seed. And just like if you bought natural plain peanut butter in a jar, the oil rises to the top, the same thing happens with tahini. You could easily pour some of that extra oil out and then just use the more solid part of the tahini. So I'm going to scrape in my tahini with my vegetables. Okay. Now I have two tablespoons or teaspoons rather of fresh chopped garlic. And then I have a half teaspoon of cumin, one eighth teaspoon of black pepper and one teaspoon of salt. Okay. And I'm going to puree this or process it in the processor. I'm going to stop in about another minute to break down the sides of the bowl. Okay. And then I got two more ingredients to add, which I'm just going to fold into this bowl. There's scallions and chives, but I don't want to put them in here because if you process them, you can rip and tear the scallions and the chives, and they taste so much better when they're just folded in. Okay, so now I stopped it. I'm actually gonna scrape down the sides of the bowl 
and then let it process for about another 30 seconds. And then I'm gonna put all that into this bowl and I'm gonna fold in finely sliced scallions and finely sliced fresh chives, okay? So now my bean dip is beautiful, it's creamy, we're good to go. Okay, so now it comes out and you can see what this looks like. Look how nice this looks, okay? And actually, I think I could come over there now so you'll be able to see better, all right? So we'll put this here. So you can see exactly, look how good this looks, just like that, right? This is beautiful celery green color. Okay, now I'm just gonna scrape it out into our bowl. It actually takes, I think, longer to scrape it out than it does to, you know, blend it and process it. So I'm gonna try to get most of it out. But in the interest of time, you know, I'm gonna, I won't clean it as good as if we were doing this interactive session right now. Okay, so I got most of it. All right. So we're looking at it. Okay, there we go. Okay, now I'm gonna fold in my scallions. You can see how finely chopped they are. So those go in. And then again, my chives, just like that, right? I'm gonna leave a little bit out to garnish the top. You'll see in a moment. So now I just take this and I'm folding this in just like this, all right? This is so good and healthy for you. So now, still got a couple things I wanna mention about this. First, I'm, we're gonna put it in our serving bowl like so, okay? I'm gonna sprinkle a little bit of chives on top, and then I'm gonna show you how Dr. Royson and I really like to eat this. So here's what we got right now, our dip in a bowl, but we don't really like to put chips in to eat it. Instead, Dr. Royson and I are big fans of broccoli. It's one of our favorite foods. Now, here's the thing with the broccoli dough. After we took our broccoli and we blanched it, and this is crisp, crunchy, and al dente, right? You only want to, so if you did put it in a pot of water, as soon as that water comes to boil, within 30 seconds, you could take that broccoli out. But you see how it's in this pan with this towel? So when we took it out, we didn't want to shock it in cold water because if we did that to stop the cooking process, this florette is like a sponge. And if I would squeeze it, it would just drip out water and dilute that beautiful garden tripe bean dip spread, right? We don't wanna do that. So instead, after I drained it, I put it in a pan and I got this towel. And so I blotted dry. So now our broccoli, and this is whether you're gonna have it with anything, this is the way to do it. Because now it is crisp, crunchy, but most importantly, this broccoli is dry. So if there was, if it was sopping wet with water, it would dilute a salad dressing or anything that you were gonna do with it. This way, it, that won't happen. Now we take our broccoli florets, and then we're gonna just put them on the sides of our serving dish like so. And so this way, hopefully in a short period of time, hopefully soon when things normalize more and we start having people where we can gather again and we can entertain and provide, you know, food and hospitality to our family and friends and guests. Now we put that over here. So we will be dipping a vegetable inside a vegetable. Everything in here is gonna love you back. You could just grab it by its stem. You go like that. And now this is an awesome, meal to have, whether you took it to work as a bag lunch, or if you're hungry and you're coming home and you want something to nosh on, this is something really healthy to nosh on. Loaded with plant-based fiber, proteins, 
and it's delicious. I'm gonna set this here for Dr. Royzen. Now I'm gonna do our dessert and you'll see what that is. Okay, so we're gonna put this on the side to make some room. Okay, so now the chocolate. Okay, here's what we got. I have two thirds cup of plain water that I'm gonna put in a pot and I'm gonna bring it to a boil, okay? Then I have our chocolate, which I have eight ounces that I'll come to show you. I have eight ounces of 70% cocoa, dark, bittersweet chocolate that I shaved just like this. So you could see these little pieces, how they are. They're not big chunks, they're just little pieces. And that's important. Here's why. Because we're gonna take that chocolate, we're gonna put it in our bowl, and you could see how it's shaved like that. When that water comes to a boil, we're gonna take the water and we're just gonna whisk the water into the chocolate, okay? So water should be coming to boil pretty soon. And it looks like we're just about there. Then we're gonna put it in some stemware, okay? So now our water is just taking a simmer. Okay, we got our water like so. Here's our chocolate. The water gets poured in. And now with our whisk, we're just gonna whisk in the water into the chocolate. The water is gonna melt the chocolate and we're gonna end up with a beautiful chocolate mousse. Now, when you refrigerate this, it's gonna get harder and harder and harder, okay? But you can see, see how it's looking now? It looks beautiful, okay? There we go. And that you want to keep whisking until you get all that chocolate melted. That's why it was really important to shave it. Okay, so look, you can see the tracks of the whip. See how it is right here? It just sticks. This is perfect. This is what you want. Okay, so now we got our stemware. And if you want to flavor this, you could flavor it with you know the zest of an orange if you don't want to use alcohol, or you could put in like Dr. Reisel mentioned sometimes some grand day, and you could put it that way as well. And here we go. So this goes in now. When this gets hard, or when this gets cool, it'll get much harder. But you can see what we have now. So here's our mousse. You could see how thick it is right here, just like this, it's beautiful. You could garnish it with chocolate shavings more if you like. I'm gonna set them both down here and I am gonna put my mask on and Dr. Royzen will come back. And if there were any questions, I see some on the chat, we could answer them later on after Dr. Royzen finishes. Okay, doc. Um, and uh, we're back, and I'm going to go back to the uh, PowerPoint um, and sharing the screen. Sorry, I'm going to go back to screen share. And then the uh, this is where we were. Um, and hopefully uh, we'll get it right. So um, let's see what's wrong here. What am I doing wrong? Yeah, so um, the garden chai bean dip you just saw, um, it looks a little bit like that. It actually looks better. I don't even know if you can see it. I'm gonna get to eat it in a little bit. And that's one of my joys in doing the cookbook is I got to eat all of these and prepare all of these. Um, it's a, what are the joys? Well, peas are a legume, but they have protein and fiber. Um, lima beans, protein and fiber, as well as a bunch of other, um, if you will, things that we need or, or nutrients that we need in small con content. Scallions are rich in allium plus fiber. Chives have fiber and vitamin K. 
artichokes, fiber, and protein. You notice the trend. This is a great dish for a meal where you want fiber and protein. Now, people say, why don't I want, uh, if you will, foods such as red meat, egg yolks, and some fish and cheese? Well, what happens is these foods get metabolized by bacteria in your gut to trimethylamine. That trimethylamine gets converted into trimethylamine invariably by your liver. That increases atherosclerosis, cancer, and dementia. How much does it do that? If you have two portions, two four ounce portions of red meat a week, 80% of us have a high enough TMAO level that it's the same risk as having an LDL cholesterol of 250. No physician would let you have an LDL of 250 without talking to you about treatment. You should have that same conversation about egg yolks, red meat, and cheese. This is the data from one study on the all-cause mortality for increases in plasma TMAO. Um, this is another study. It's now been done in 13 different institutions across the world. TMAO is one of those factors that we get from food through the bacteria in our gut that has huge um, implications for disease. We treat statins that lower it by 1.4 risk. This is raises it um, to 2.1 or twice as much, if you will, um, with a high meat diet. The other thing is blood sugar. You don't want to have simple sugars. That's another thing we avoid in all these recipes because not only does it cause inflammation in you because of the fat, but it attaches to proteins like hemoglobin grout protein, making those proteins less functional. I'm going to skip over the video because of time. Um, and the third problem is it results, as we've said before, in uh, decreased mitochondrial energy production. Um, so preventing brain dysfunction, most important thing is what you're doing through the book club and through your friends, manage stress. There are four components of physical activity. And then the next and most important thing is in fact, um, food. What happens with food, as we showed, when you get ketosis, you get rid of the old cells and you produce new cells when you eat again. So that's the important thing. You've got old and new cells. And the reason old cells are bad is they like rotten food. They create the cells around them stop functioning as well. So Jim likes to say nutrition not only is the second most fat important factor, but has four aspects. You, no one governs what is in your stomach more than you do. You want to have only food that loves you back and a few supplements. When you want to eat in concert with that circadian rhythm, more early, less later. And Jim Perko showed you a couple of the techniques that I think are so important, such as when you're blanching uh, vegetables, do it in cool air, not water. That keeps them crisp and crunchy in the way people like them, unless you like it soggy. So 10 commandments, eat only when the sun is out, more early, less later, stop stereotyping food. A salmon burger or cold um, pasta is great for breakfast and a salad and egg frittata wonderful for dinner. You can eat well in any situation. It just takes a little planning. Um, we skipped over some of these. Mistakes shouldn't disrail you. Every time derail you, it should be. Every time the sun comes out, it's another chance to get back on the wagon. And remember our most important one, food is a relationship. You should love what you eat and it should love you back. I'm skipping over some of these just to get to what was Elvis's major contribution and how much was it worth to America? Well, Elvis got immunized against polio on TV. Prior to this, 0.3% of Americans had gotten immunized who were available to get immunized. Within eight months of his getting immunized, and by the way, that's the Surgeon General immunizing him on all three major TV networks. There are only three in 19. 
56 plus PBS, and it was on all four of those. And that's the head nurse in the public health service. She's more concerned with the Surgeon General passing out than Elvis passing out. But anyway, within eight months of that, 83.2% of Americans got immunized against polio. It went around the world, in Germany especially, where he was. And he literally is responsible for wiping out polio because of that. That's why you're seeing all the people who are getting immunized get immunized on TV. And so remember this, you can't pour from an empty cup. Take care of yourself first and always so that you can help serve others. Um, you heard about the disclosure, that's the books. I'm going to now unscreen share and we'll go to answering questions. I'm gonna invite Jim back in here um, since the technique questions he is the real expert on. Um, and uh, let me put my mask on and invite him back in. I'm going to break the mask for just a, a few seconds. Um, and that's to have some of the chocolate mousse. I am a chocolate hall. Tom? Okay, well, first of all, I wish I had eaten before our, our session because that was really fabulous. And you provided us some really uh, wonderful information about um, a, a lot of different areas. Um, some questions that have come in really deal with um, the intermittent fasting. What you talked about as far as the circadian rhythm and food and intermittent fasting, how it affects our, our DNA. But how about Leslie ask why if she can't intermittent fast or hasn't been successful for her, is there another diet that you recommend, like the zone diet, for example, that might be um, more or helpful, especially about macronutrients? Um, probably the Mediterranean, if, if you're saying what diet is best of all the diets, it is the Mediterranean diet. That is, it's essentially a pesca vegan or pesca vegetarian diet, meaning a couple brands of fish such as um, uh, salmon and ocean trout, um, those fish that are low in uh, toxins, uh, plus um, as much vegan as you can get, meaning as much plant-based as you can get. And if you can eliminate dairy and egg, egg yolks, that's great. Egg whites are fine. Great, great. And just to carry on along those lines, um, <clears throat> Leslie actually asked a second question as far as you're elevating your plasma levels um, with red meat. Is that for all red meat? Is that for grocery meat, for grass fed, or does it matter? It doesn't matter. It's the protein. It's not, and the protein is carnitine, lecithin, and choline, plus saturated fat. We don't know why this does it but it's been reproducibly done. It selects out bacteria that love it. And about 80, in some place between 82 and 88% of um, the world's population end up with the problem, which is most of us, 82 to 88%. And what that problem is, is the bacteria we have produce trimethylamine when they get carnitine, lecithin, or choline, when combined with saturated fat. It, there's something weird in that um, carnitine tablets don't do it. They need the saturated fat with it. And lecithin and choline in soy products don't do it, but they do do it in cheese and egg yolks. And we're not sure why that difference is, but it's a really dramatic difference. So it isn't whether it's grass fed or not, because it is the same carnitine and the same saturated fat. Got it, got it. And before we leave intermittent fasting, um, Tom, I think you have a question about um, shift work. Yeah, so. Tom, I think you're muted. Sorry, hi, doctor. Hi. Now you're now you're sideways, but oh, I. Oh, am I? Oh, you got to change your. There you oh. go. Uh, what if I have a night shift job? What if I work overnight and the sun's obviously down and I work okay. nights? And I so so the, data, the data we have for night shift, believe it or not, they're not human studies, but the animal studies look like it's the same concept. 
That is, you want to eat earlier in your awake day and stop eating three hours before you go to bed. Many shift workers come home and have a big, if you will, breakfast with their family and then go to bed. That's the same as eating a big dinner and going to bed right on. So you want to, the, the principle is the majority of your calories should be consumed eight or more hours before you go to bed and stop eating totally three hours before you go to bed. Okay, thank you. So before we get into some of the food questions, another um, limited food that you recommend is, or limiting is <clears throat> dairy products, except for yogurt. Would kefir also be in that category? Um, no, kefir is uh, something, kefir is in the good category, if you will. Um, but in fact, there are a whole bunch of others, um, if you will, fermented foods such as sauerkraut, et cetera, uh, and uh, miso, all of those foods are, we think are healthy in that respect because, and their, their benefits outweigh the risk because we want a diverse, um, if you will, set of bacteria inside our gut, what is called a diverse microbiome because the diversity again, correlates with, we don't know whether it's cause and effect, but correlates with people living longer and keeping their brain function longer. Got it, got it. Well, we have a couple questions for Jim also. And Good, I'm gonna put my mask on and have Jim come over closer to the computer. So Wendy, <clears throat> Wendy Juren asks, for the mousse recipe that you made that looks delicious, um, why doesn't the chocolate seize up when the water is added? That's a great question. So it's the ratio of water to chocolate. If you have a little, if you have chocolate, just a smidge of the water, it'll seize. Real gritty and granular, right? But that was two thirds cup of water that had to be hot. And when we whisked it in, it melted and it never seized because of the ratio of liquid to chocolate, okay? That was actually developed by a gentleman named Herve, H-E-R-V-E, who is a French physical chemist. And I always thought, you know, chocolate would seize when a small amount of water, but he figured out that adding enough of it, that's what would happen, that would be the outcome and result. A similar analogy would be if you were gonna make a ganache, right? It's where you would take, instead of water, you would take like milk or an alternative milk, almond milk, soy milk. You, as long as you got enough of it, you put the alternative milk in with the chocolate and whisk it. The difference between putting an alternative milk than water is huge. Here's why. That chocolate mousse was nice now and it's a mousse now, but if it was refrigerated after about three or four hours, it's not gonna be a mousse anymore. It's gonna be hard, right? If you would use soy milk or hemp milk, and even almond milk, but soy and hemp milk has more fat. Soy milk's got 12 grams of uh, 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 fat per cup of milk, as well as 120 calories. That fat in the soy milk or the hemp milk would actually keep that chocolate softer and it'd be like a ganache, meaning if you ever had a chocolate truffle, when, you, when they, they make ganache, they scoop it out and then they dip it in chocolate, the outside's hard, but the, soft, the inside is soft. That's because of the fat that was added in the form of either soy milk or hemp milk, which would make it healthier than heavy cream or anything like that. Hmm. I hope that explains. I, and I have a question for you also. I, I, in your, you give really great little tips throughout the book as far as cooking techniques. And one of, one of them was actually just putting a dish towel underneath a cutting board so it doesn't slip. Something as easy as that. And I'm wondering if you have any sort of um, tricks of the trade or something that you can share with us, either your maybe favorite kitchen gadget or something that you'd recommend for people who are just sort of starting to cook. Right, so uh, I got my mask on. Gabby, can you give me a skimmer, please? Or, uh, we'll see if I have a dish machine. So you, you're right. This is a great gadget to have right here. This is called a skimmer. What's really important about it 
is this, is that if you've got a pot, okay, and you cook your pot, and you got vegetables in here. So let's say we do a recipe in the book, and if you want to make a rutabaga mash where you took rutabagas, which is great this time of year, it's a root vegetables and carrots and sweet potatoes or turnips, right? It, rutabaga will take twice as long to cook as a carrot. So I put water in there, I put the rutabaga in. Now I could take it out with my skimmer, really easy. I set it in a side in a bowl or a pan. Then I put in my carrots and then I'll take them out, I'll put in my sweet potatoes. Well, here's what's happened. Not only is it easy to take them out with this skimmer or the broccoli when I was cooking it, but instead of throwing the water out to put it in the strainer, this water is reducing down, 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 down. When it reduces down, it intensifies in flavor. Now it's this beautiful vegetable broth because you're reducing it. So those rutabagas got a lot of naturally occurring sugar, as does carrots, as does a sweet potato. When you cook those, the resolving liquor as it goes down becomes a little thicker, but it intensifies in flavor. And then you can add it back to the vegetables and mash it. You can add a slurry or make it a sauce, but it's so much easier to retain it using a skimmer rather than dumping it through a strainer. Great idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, so all that is part of culinary literacy. And what's important about culinary medicine, culinary medicine combines the science that Dr. Roizen talks about with the joy and art of cooking. Because we want to help people change their behaviors. And the more they increase their culinary literacy, their, their skill set, the easier it is for them to execute these recipes. Great. Um, I'm just going to give you and, you. and as you noted, Sandra, there's a sizable section in the book on technique, which gives you a lot of those type of tips. Gotcha. Um, a other question is, what do you think about um, all of the collagen supplements um, being marketed now? And what are your recommendations for supplements? That was the last thing that you said as far as um, in the lecture. So that's a whole nother book that you can invite me back for next year. <laughs> uh, but there are 10, uh, there are in, in the What to Eat When book, that original book that we talked about last year, there are um, a, a list of the 10 supplements that have been shown. And there were eight at that time, now there are 10 that have been shown to make a difference to human health. From a standpoint of collagen, it's a very controversial subject because what happens when you take in a protein collagen, you break it down into its a component amino acids by your stomach and duodenum. So by the time you absorb it, it's just a series of amino acids and peptides. It's not collagen anymore. So the fact, is it good for, well, those amino acids, if you're not getting them any other way, Getting them in collagen is a great way of getting them, except it's a very expensive way of getting them. You can get them in uh, protein from salmon and um, soy, et cetera, or egg white or quinoa much easier and much less expensively than as, as collagen pills. So now I'm going to say something else, Sandra, that yesterday, <laughs> it really was yesterday, Remember I said about you can reboot your epigenetics? There is a large study out of the United Kingdom which retook people with wrinkled skin and scraped it off, put it into a test tube where they were able by turning on three of the four Yamanaka factors to make young skin smooth, get rid of the wrinkles. They believe they're going to be able to do that in, that is the, the substances they use are fine and they're gonna do that. So we may end up not having that Botox or anything else, just using this and get a wrinkle-free skin. Now imagine you can do that to your cartilage and your joints, you would end up. So yesterday was the proof of principle in a specific organ of that epigenetic, um, hypothesis, it's also been shown to be also for 
wet macular degeneration was shown by another group. Fascinating. That's the business to go into. <laughs> Tom, I think you have another question. We need to unmute you, Tom. Yes, I'm here. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, what do you think of the my plate? Formerly, it was the food pyramid recommended by the USDA. So, what do you think of, of the plate as far as the portion sizes? Um, what happened is the science group did not get followed on the release that occurred about a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago now. And so the nutrition community of which I'm a member, if you will, is unhappy that industry, but it has it every year, industry had so much. So although they said to cut out sugar, it's still in there. Although they said to, um, if you will, decrease red meat, it's still in there. I mean, so the actual release wasn't what the science group advised. Now, as far as portion size, half of your plate at least should be vegetables, we believe. So, um, if, and if you wanna make uh, the other half, the other, uh, a quarter of it whole grains and a quarter of it um, protein, that's great. But remember what you wanna do is always love the food you're eating so learn how to use spices, et cetera. That's a lot of what Jim uh, and Mike Crupain, who did the, the majority, vast majority, the two of them did the vast majority of the recipes in the book. Um, and you want to do um, learn spices like Jim teaches you in the technique section to, to get the taste you love. So there's a section of how to make something sweet without sugar, how to make something Unami without fat, how to make something salty without salt. And those are things that are really um, key for enjoying it and it loving you back. Dr. Royson, how much time do we have? We have a couple more questions. Let's go through them. I'm, I, I, I don't, I know we're over time, so, but I'm glad to go through them. Okay, got two more questions. So um, I'm not sure what, um, Alice is referring to, you may want to, but I think when she says, will this work if you're a diabetic? I assume that means intermittent fasting. So if you're a type one diabetic or on medication, especially insulin, you want to work with your physician before you do intermittent fasting, especially for type one diabetics or um, those on insulin. Now, sometime soon, we'll all have a, uh, the, essentially a Dexcom 6 or a, another one of the uh, um, monitors on our watch that reads glucose levels minute to minute for all of us, not just for diabetics, and there won't be a problem in following that. But for now, especially if you're on insulin, on the other hand, for most other diabetics, they will both lose weight for it and get healthier. So ketosis is not a bad thing. Um, it's healthy for the brain, but I would urge um, anyone who's on diabetic medicine or on insulin, this is a great way of reversing prediabetes and bringing it, if you're told you got prediabetes and are not on anything, this is a superb way. Um, and remember, in that period of fasting, enjoy uh, water, tea, uh, black coffee, et cetera. We don't want you to get dehydrated during that period. Great, great. And um, Dorothy asks, is there a, is there, you're, you're talking about seafood and how seafood actually um, can be so beneficial. Is shrimp included in that? Um, unfortunately, the, uh, if you will, the shrimp and uh, mussels, et cetera, the, are not in that group. So it is, uh, sardines are in it, um, anchovies are in it, and then it is, uh, mainly uh, salmon and ocean trout. Those are the ones that predictably have a lot of DHA. Um, DHA is the three, three letters. It's the three letter omega-3 that is most beneficial for your brain. Great, great. And one last question um, as far as- And by the way, I, I, Sandra, just so you do, I am willing to come back next year or the year after whenever for the, for the supplement part of it. Oh, we're, we're signing you up right now. Same time next year. We'd love it. 
but we do have one more question about soy products. Your your opinion in general uh, about the 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 um, how healthy soy products are. So the data are pretty clear that that you that even people who've had breast cancer, or even estrogen sensitive or responsive or positive, uh, if you will, breast cancer, that soy does not increase that risk. Um, there um, doesn't increase the risk of prostate cancer, et cetera. So those are the main concerns with it. And it seems, and especially the uh, fermented soy products are great too. Um, so I'm a, a believer in uh, soy products. Now, read the labels because a lot of soy milk has sugar added. Um, and so you don't want, uh, it, it should be the soy product itself and, and the more soy protein or the more natural soy it is, the better. Great, great. Um, you know, and, and Tom, I just wanted to ask you, do you have any other questions? I think that was the last one we have on the screen. Yeah, yes, that's all I have. I really appreciate. Uh, doctor, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for your new book. And I will hold you to it that you will come back next year. So Tom, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege for you and Sandra. Thanks, Chef Jim. Um, and uh, the, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look forward to being uh, back next year, hopefully in person. Yes. I hope so. And it truly is a, a fabulous book. Kudos to both you. of you guys. They're terrific. Aren't um, those pictures tremendous? They're tremendous. And more importantly, the recipes are tremendous. So uh, I, I really enjoyed going through it. It's a terrific book and we can't thank you enough. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Thank you. And I just want to tell everybody that we continue to have a great lineup of the Jewish Book Festival. So go to jewishvirginia.org backslash book festival to see all the upcoming events. Thank you so much.